some of it is inappropriate, but some of it's not. They're just reacting. Uh, Mary DeMuth, a literary agent and prolific author of Christian books. Now, I, I've never heard of her, but have you ever heard of her? She's prolific, though, whoever she is. Uh, attended Lake Point Church in suburban Dallas for more than 23 years before leaving in December after she alleged senior pastor Josh Howerton began routinely revealing misogynistic beliefs during Sunday ser sermons. Amanda Cunningham, a former actor and model who went to Lake Point for 12 years, cut ties with the megachurch in March after she said it apparently eliminated women's ministries. Even while Howerton invited men to watch sports at Lake Point's non-alcoholic tailgating events. Um, that was probably not the smartest thing he could do there, but anyway, that's that culture. Um, Got to have fun. Have fun and learn about Christ. All right. Um, okay, so after he had his non-alcoholic tailgating event, uh, and after that, Howerton told a now infamous quote-unquote old preacher joke. I don't, I don't know about this one either. To the congregation about what women should do for their new husbands on their wedding nights. I don't know the joke, so don't ask me. But it's an old preacher joke. Not sure what it is, but okay. Melissa Ware got out of Lake Point just last month after learning Howerton allegedly plagiarized his apology to the congregation for the joke from a similar apology by a Florida pastor and after church staff reportedly tried to manipulate a traffic study to get a traffic light installed near its entrance. So why you'd have to plagiarize the apology, I don't get, but unless he's trying to watch out for legal stuff. Um, to get a light in front of his church that, that's different uh, these women and others explain to me ways Howerton has allegedly fostered an increasingly right wing bro culture inside the church and said they're among quote unquote hundreds who over the past two years have broken away from Lake Point a majority white middle to upper class conservative congregation in Rotwall, Texas. Possibly thousands of members, they allege, are now in the process of leaving uh, the church. In Cunningham's view, Lake Point has become very cultish in recent years. She alleged that Howerton has discouraged congregants from reading the Dallas Morning News which I would probably agree with that, and other outlets that publish stories about him. Well, okay. Uh, many members, she said, have been meeting in small group, small ministry groups instead of attending Sunday services at Lake Point. Should they be doing that? And this is instead of. Mm, okay. So they're doing this instead of going to church, uh, which still boasts crowds of more than 20,000 across its six Dallas Fort Worth campuses. Howerton, who, influence, who influences who more than 193,000 followers through his Instagram account has recently posted videos telling people to stop validating everyone's feelings. <gasps> In other words, don't be politically correct. I would agree with that. Uh, he sent out messages denouncing President Joe Biden, okay, and discouraging native Californians from voting in Texas. 
I would agree with that one too. <laughs> it's a coarse, arrogant culture, said Cunningham, who added that her family faced backlash from Lake Point staff and its members for calling out Howerton's increasingly ultra-conservative rhetoric. He's constantly injecting jokes and illustrations that demean women and their bodies. Uh, they don't give an example other than the wedding night joke, so I don't know what that means. Yeah. I think they don't like his conservative views, and they're just throwing in some of this other stuff to, to make it spicy. You gotta be you. You gotta be a hate group if you're conservative. Uh, Lake Point did not respond to multiple attempts, requests for comments. I wonder why. Another former Lake Point employee who spoke on the condition of anonymity. Why I don't know. They don't work there anymore because she fears retaliation. I don't know how, but maybe they're going. She's afraid they're going to do a drive-by at her house or something. Uh, detailed how founding pastor Steve Stroop, I think, expanded the church during 40 years of preaching before passing the baton to Howerton in 2020. She said the church first developed a toxic culture of oversized egos and verbal abuse from staff under Stroop. However, she said Stroop preached Jesus, while Howerton leans on personal anecdotes rather than biblical teachings and messages. She also claimed he hired scrubbers to clear critical comments from the church's social media. Everything is an image thing, she said. So it's very clear when we started speaking up that people in the bubble were pushing us out. Uh, DeMuth and her husband, a graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary, said they started attending the church in 2001. Uh, along with their children, uh, they led a Bible study, they've led Bible study groups and planted a church in France. Uh, I'm sorry, that's my pet peeve on that. He ain't got no business being in Dallas planting a franchise church in France. Let France plant their own churches. That's just my pet peeve. Um, she represented the congregation while speaking as a survivor of sexual abuse at the SBC's national conference, which they had uh, a couple of years ago, I think. That's when a lot of preachers got in trouble. Uh, but said as ministries were eliminated that church staff told her she was no longer welcome to serve at Lake Point. In 2022, DeMuth and her husband found themselves discussing the undercurrent of misogyny at the church during car rides home. I couldn't stomach it anymore, DeMuth said. According to many former Lake Point members, Howerton at times told his congregation that if what I just said bothers you. You need to find another church. Adding very honestly, we need your parking spot. While some from the congregation said they were bothered by such statements, others accused Howerton of using gaslighting methods to sow doubt among members. Some people will never see him doing wrong, the former employee said. But there's a growing number of people who started out liking him now have their eyes open and are leaving. Uh, it goes on after that. Let me see if anything's worth. Oh, it's about over. Okay. Many former members are now church shopping in Rockwall and the surrounding area and running into ex members after ditching Howerton Sunday services. Cunningham said, Still, there's thousands of people who remain plugged into the church. She said, Because they have a family and close friends in ministry or have already signed their children up for summer camp there. So, uh, interesting the issues you run into.
when you're trying to keep a mega church afloat. Mm-hmm. Um, what was his name? Jim Hilton. He was from Lake Wood, I believe. No, when he was in Texas then. I think it was Lake Wood. Or Lake something. That was Lake Point. I didn't know there were so many lakes in Dallas, but... Anyway, so I thought that was interesting to read. Um, Why is that? I don't know the old preacher jokes. I can't get in trouble for telling you. Well, it, you, when you're in a time of insanity, your politicians always reflect it. So, remember, politicians, like it or not, are just a reflection of the population at any given point. So, the the country was worried after Obama, and rightly so, and so they put Trump in, and they got so comfortable with Trump, then he. They did well. He makes people feel bad because he says bad things on Twitter, and uh, so their their mood was: we just want somebody nice up there who's just gonna get along with everybody. Well, that's what they got, and with it came inflation, open borders, and all the other stuff. And so we'll see what the mood of the country is in November. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I'll have to be careful what I say now that we're YouTube stars. I think we have two people that watch us each week. All right, uh, Acts 8. I think we did a little bit on Acts 8 last week, but I could not remember. So we're just going to start at verse 1 and run with it. Not going to get through the whole thing tonight. It's a very long chapter, and I'm too tired to do it. So we'll go as we go and call it quits for tonight and pick up next week. Um, now, the week of July 4th, we won't meet. I meant to send you a text about that today, whenever that is. Three weeks. Okay. Because of whatever the wind is changing, it's through hell. They're leaving Mississippi. Okay. Okay. Well, I was just going to let you know what I had on my mind. Okay. So the week of July 4th, we won't meet. Um, I know last, I think it was last, we used to, I can't remember if we did last year or not, used to, we wouldn't meet hardly at all in July, and, um, but that's up to y'all, if y'all need a break, we'll take a break, since you're the, the core that comes, or if you want to keep going, we'll keep going after the four. Well, 
Oh, I've had it down to two before. But if you want to meet, I'm taking that as your commitment to be here. So they're going the whole month right at it. Yeah. Well, life goes on. So. So we don't have to decide tonight. I was just throwing that out. Uh, we won't meet the July Fourth week, but if you need, if you want to take a couple of weeks off, we can. And. Uh, that's just up to you. And if that happens, those nights I go home, I will not leave the house once I get there. <laughs> it is? Okay. All righty. Well, we'll work all that out. <clears throat> okay. Chapter 8. Verse 1, Saul approved of his, or Stephen's, execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Why did that happen? Or, or the question that usually gets asked is, why would God allow that to happen? Mm-hmm. Where it said the persecution hit and they scattered. Yeah, but, but why, why would God allow that to happen? There you go. There you go. That's right. He had told them, go where? Judea, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. Where had they gone? To Jerusalem. Jerusalem was their incubator. It's where they got their start. They finally got the old truck, jumped off, so it would run. And now it's time for them to spread out. Now, if you had asked them if it's time to spread out, they'd have probably told you no. Because that's just human nature. Human nature is when we get our environment worked out the way we like it, and it's comfortable, and in their case, this always happens anytime revival breaks out in a church. Everybody congregates at the church. But see, revival wasn't meant for congregating. Revival was meant to congregate, to be recharged, to go out. But they don't want to go out. They want to just congregate. And we just want to sit here and get blessed. And, and so instead of church being a fueling station, it becomes a rest home. And, and people just want to hang out there till death comes. And we're going to have a good time. And we're going to, woo, we're going to shout and jump and holler and carry on. And people are going to fall out. And people are going to get saved. People are going to get delivered. And we're going to stomp and snort. We're going to give the devil a black eye and all this other kind of stuff in the building. And then when it's over, we're all going to go out the building to life as normal. And so God knew. The only way these people were ever going to get out of Jerusalem, he was going to have to force them out. It's kind of like we got some sparrows, I guess they're sparrows, some kind of birds, build a little nest up on our porch every year. I tear it down. When they leave, they build it back when they come back. They build their little nest. They lay their little eggs up there. And before long, we're here, chirp, 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 chirp. Last year, they had four in it. I don't know how they got in there, but they had four in that nest. Well, that's okay for the first couple of weeks 
Because they're just trip, 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 trip. And Daddy Bird goes and he finds stuff to feed them with and he brings it back to the nest. We sit there and watch him do this. He'll bring stuff back for them to eat and they're chirp, chirp, chirp. And every now and then he'll crawl in there and let the mama bird go out and fly around a little bit. And, but those birds get bigger. And eventually, last year, they'd had so many, the birds got so big, it forced the parents out of the nest. And the bird, the babies took over the nest. But there came a day when those birds started jumping out of that nest because mama bird got up there and started nudging them out. She was forcing them to get out to learn how to fly. And sure enough, we came home and I saw all these little birds flying all over the place. What in the world? They had come out of that nest. That's what God was doing. He was forcing the birds out of the nest because if he hadn't done this, they would be in Jerusalem to this day. And they'd still be having church and having a great time in church. Woo! Boy, we're changing the world in here. But nothing out there. All right, so they forced them out. God forced them out. And um, now, verse 4. Now, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. And Philip, now you remember Philip. Philip was not, an, the, he was a deacon. He was like Stephen. He was a man who had been chosen as a deacon. But God called him to preach. So, like Stephen, he's going to start preaching, but he's not going to preach in Jerusalem. He's going to Samaria. Now, you know the background of Samaria, I guess. Samaria was not a place Jews liked to go. They did not like each other. Samaritans didn't like Jews. Jews didn't like Samaritans. And it's because of their heritage. The Samaritans were not all Jew. They were a mixture of Jew and something. And that goes back to the time when the Assyrians defeated the northern kingdom in 722 B.C., and they hauled off most of the population. And they spread them out through, throughout the Assyrian Empire. When they were taken out, others were brought in and uh, set up shop there, took over their farms, took over their houses and everything else. And those people who went off never came back. Unlike in the southern kingdom where the Babylonian, there will be a group of them who come back. Those in the northern kingdom never came back. And so they had people who moved in who were not Jewish. Some were Syrian, some were something else. And they intermarried over time with the Jewish people who were there. And the race of people who came out of that was the Samaritans. And so the Samaritans and the Jews did not get along for that reason. Well, back at the very beginning of the divided kingdom. If you remember, that had what resulted from Solomon's son uh, being asked to lighten up on the taxes because Solomon had become so oppressive on his taxation so he could fund his extravagant life. And his son, Rehoboam, went to the wise men and said, what should I do? And so he went to his father's wise men who were all older men, uh, much like his dad when his dad finally died. And he asked them, what should I do? And they said, every one of them said, lighten up. You need to win the favor of these people right now. So lighten up on the taxes. He went to his new group of advisors, which was all his young buddies, and asked them, and they said, lighten up, forget that. You need to show them who's in charge. You tell them you haven't seen nothing yet like what you're about to see. And it split the, the kingdom, okay? Well, Jeroboam was the one who led the revolt. And when he broke away from the, the southern kingdom, he took 10 tribes with him. So the northern kingdom's gonna be 10 tribes. The southern kingdom's going to be two. So you've got Judah and Benjamin in the south, and you, the rest of them are in the north. The first thing Jeroboam did when he created his new kingdom, 
was he built two temples because he did not want the people from the northern kingdom going back to Jerusalem to worship lest they shift their allegiance back to the southern kingdom. So he decided the best option because under Judaism, where'd you have to go to worship? You had to travel to Jerusalem, go to the temple. And even if you were a Jew, you were supposed to go there three times a year, no matter where you were, to, for three different required uh, festivals. So that was very expensive, very time-consuming, very inconvenient, especially if you didn't live there. So Jeroboam's idea was, I could win him over because he created a new religion. He took Judaism, combined it with Egyptian mythology, Canaanite mythology, and a little bit of other stuff, and he made this new version of Judaism. And the way he was going to win people over to it was he made worship convenient. He built two temples. He built one on the northern end of the northern kingdom, and he built one on the southern end of the northern kingdom. Now, when we go through, and, and they, it wasn't long before they were just, idolatry was part of it from the beginning, but it wasn't long before they were just full-blown idolatry and they go into Baal worship. But by the time we get here to, the, to Jesus' time, one of those two temples is still operating. And it's the one that the Samaritans used at Mount Gerizim. And so when Jesus has the encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well, remember the first thing she asked? One of the first things she asked was, you say we're supposed to worship at your temple in Jerusalem. We say we're supposed to worship at our temple at Mount Gerizim. Who's right? And so Jesus immediately diverts the conversation and basically says, time's coming, neither one of you is going to be right. It's not going to be because God's not going to be dwelling in buildings made of hands. Okay? But right now, the Samaritans are still worshiping at Mount Gerizim. So their ideas of, first of all, they don't know anything about Christianity yet. And so Philip goes up there. They've heard some things. And so it looks like what they have received so far wasn't right, which is not uncommon. It looks like the United Pentecostals got there first. Because it said, they said they had been baptized in Jesus' name only, which is what they do. They baptize in Jesus' name only, which Philip said is insufficient. So let's get back into it. I just wanted to cover that a little bit so this would make sense. So Philip went down to the city of Samaria. Now, Samaria is the capital of Samaria. Okay, so you've got a city of Samaria. You've got the region that's also called Samaria. And proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds were in one accord, paid attention to what he, was, what he said. When they heard him and saw the signs he did. Oh, there we go, another one who wasn't an apostle who was still operating in signs and wonders. And that's one of the cessationist arguments is that only the apostles could operate in signs and wonders, and they died off with them. And it's not true. Uh, for unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many of them, and many who were paralyzed or lamed were healed. So there was much joy in that city. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. Don't you love that? He went around telling people how great he was. Boy, look at me. Ooh, I'm something. Yeah. They all paid attention to him for it, from the least to the greatest, saying this man is the, is the power of God that is called great. 
And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news, the good news about what? The kingdom of God. As he preached the good news and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing the signs of great miracles performed, he was amazed. So verse 14. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the gospel, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them, uh, had, let's see, I lost them, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money saying, Give me this power also so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Now was that wrong? Well, not in his world, but it was that wrong for him, what he did there. So he sees what's going on. He sees all these signs and wonders happening. He sees that when they laid hands on the people, they're filled with the Spirit. And he, he, he sees all this stuff going on. And so he decides, I want this. And he assumes, because he doesn't know any better, he assumes it's something like he learned his craft from somebody. He assumed he was going to have to pay to learn these skills from the apostles so he could add them to his show. So was he wrong to have asked for this? Well, that's what it says in verse 19. He said, give me this power. I want this power. So was he wrong? To buy it? Okay. I don't know. Peter thought it was wrong. Because Peter said in verse 20, may your silver perish with you. Because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. That's pretty stern. That, that's some pretty stout words. And then he says, for I see that you, you are in the gall of bitterness. Everyone, you ever heard anybody use that phrase? You're in the gall of bitterness. And in the bond of iniquity. And Simon prayed, and Simon answered, pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Well, there must have been something left out there where he said, this is going to happen to you because of this. And, and that part was left out. Why, I don't know. But, uh, so what is Peter saying to him there? He first of all tells him, you can't buy the power of God. You can't manipulate God with money, in other words. And uh, sometimes some... That's a good question. I looked it up, and the only thing I get is gall is that yucky fluid produced in the liver. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it, you can understand why they think it, but that 
Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, he probably thought they would say, oh, okay, give us a little love offering here and we'll show you how to do this. And this could be a new trick you can use. Um, when I was reading that, I thought about a guy I know. He is he's quite a character. He has paid to learn how to um, hypnotize people. And uh, not for like going down the road and seeing Sister Catherine who will hypnotize you and help you lose weight, but like on a stage in Vegas. And that's his new thing he's making a living doing, and he'll do his show, and he'll call people up and hypnotize them and get them to do crazy stuff. But he had to pay for that. It cost him a lot of money. He had to learn it from somebody who was already doing it. So that's what what I had to get a picture of here. That he's just trying to say, y'all teach teach me your tricks, and I'll pay you for it. Uh, so Peter said, "Let your silver perish with you." Uh, verse twenty one: You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of the wickedness of yours, and pray that pray to God that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. Was Simon saved? I don't know. Sounds like Peter's questioning it. So, if he can see he's stuck in the gall of bitterness. I, yeah, I tend to believe just, I hadn't given this hours of study just off the cuff. I tend to believe he was born again, but he's a great example of why the goal is not getting people saved, it's getting people transformed. And that's why sanctification is not optional. And any church, preacher, ministry that preaches justification is necessary, but sanctification is optional, is lying. It's not true. And this is a great example of a man who probably was born again, but his life, his heart had not been transformed yet. Now, we don't know how much time had passed between his conversion and and them showing up, it doesn't say, but however much time, you know, it, it is true that when someone, everyone, when they get saved, needs a worldview reformation. We all do, because we come in to the faith screwed up. Our worldviews are have been influenced by the culture, have been shaped in anti-God ways to believe anti-God things, and that needs to be reformed. You don't get that doing carpet time. You do that walking it out through that process of sanctification. So he has not made much progress in sanctification yet. Where does he go after this? I don't know. But he sure got a stern rebuke from Peter right here about getting it right, getting his heart right, and and having to finally break away from his old ways of doing things because his old way of doing things was manipulating people out of their money using sorcery in whatever way he did it. So the same is true for us. When when a person gets saved, they're made right with God. A new spirit comes alive in them, but they're not changed yet. They have to be deprogrammed. Their mind has to be deprogrammed. And 
part of that worldview reformation is that God presents you with the truth. I'll tell you how the Holy Spirit usually works. He's going to expose us to some truth that is a weakness in our lives. And when he exposes us to that truth, then he's going to bring situations along where we're going to have to put that truth into practice. And if we do, and if we're successful, and, and, and we keep doing it, and doing it, and doing it, and doing it, do you have to think about brushing your teeth in the morning? Because you don't do it, yeah. But for those who do it, you don't go in there and pick up your toothbrush and say, now, now what is this thing for? What, what? I put that on there? Well, and then what did I do with it again? No, no one does that. You're probably like me in about half asleep and you feel around for the toothpaste and put it on there, squeeze it out. I always squeeze from the middle and drive Danita crazy. And... Uh, and it and I you know I don't look at it in the mirror and say now what is this thing for? No. When I was a kid, my mother would taught me what a toothbrush was for, and you know what? Eventually, I had to do it myself, and I had to and I would do it every day, and it became routine. And when it became routine, see, here's the thing about truth. And, and this is, when we're talking about discipleship, this is what we're talking about, is we practice truth to the point it becomes automatic. So that when you get in a situation where that truth would apply, you don't have to sit there and say, ooh, I better get out my Bible and find out what to do here. It just comes like that. Just like brushing your teeth. You've done it so much, you can do it in your sleep. And that's the way truth is supposed to work, that we've done it so much. It's so part of our routine. It's second nature, and we don't have to think about it anymore. We just do it automatically. The term for that is thinking Christianly. So where the ways of God are our ways. And it isn't something that requires a whole lot of thought. Once we've been practicing and going through our routine, it's just like learning to do karate or something like that. You, you know, when you see somebody who's practiced for years do all that stuff, I just sit there and go, wow, that's amazing. Or, or like one of the summer kids playing the piano. Did you ever sit there and just go, wow, that's amazing. If I get over there and do it, it's not going to sound like that. You won't be amazed by mine because I have it put into practice. But that's what truth is for is to be practiced and practice and practice and practice until it becomes a habit, until it becomes our routine. So for Simon, he hasn't made much progress in that direction yet. He's still thinking with that old mind. And so that's why Peter rebukes him and says, brother, you better get doing some repenting. Because you're screwed up. I don't think he was telling him he was lost. Probably Philip had already, I'm sure he had probably already been on Peter's radar. Just watching, observing. And so I, I imagine him and Philip had had a conversation about him already. But Peter nails him because he's living out of his old nature instead of the new. All right, we're getting restless, so I'm going to wrap it up. Repent, therefore. I'm getting restless anyway. All right. Uh, repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours and pray the Lord. If possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven. Wait a minute. I always hear folks preaching and talking nowadays about, well, if you just halfway repent, God's just so glad you're doing that. He's just going to pour loads of forgiveness all over you and loads of grace because he's just desperate for somebody to give him a chance. That's not, Peter would say, you better pray and hope that God will forgive you. Putting a little fear of God in him, which he probably needed. 
If possible, he'll forgive the intent of your heart. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. So what we're seeing there, we don't know what the bitterness part was. But the bond of iniquity is what was operating in what he was trying to do. Iniquity is similar to sin, except that iniquity refers to a nature that's bent towards sin. So his, his iniquity nature, his fallen nature... You know, when, when we're born again, that fallen nature's put to death. But we have a good knack at bringing it back to life. We do spiritual CPR on, them, some, on that fallen nature sometimes and get this old stuff that we haven't been deprogrammed from yet stirring again. Well, Simon prayed. Noah, Simon answered, pray for me that nothing of what you have said will come upon me. Now, when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. So we're going to stop there for tonight. This will be John's exit from the story. We don't know when, but sometime after this, uh, John... And Mary, the mother of Jesus, moved to Ephesus. Um, and they'll spend the rest of their lives there. Both of their graves are there. Their houses are there. Uh, they can take you today to where they lived. Huh? No. She had a little place. They both lived outside of town. Because if you lived outside of town, the city officials would leave you alone. If you went to town, you had to abide by all the immorality stuff. Um, but they both had, play, he, she had a modest home outside of town. He had a modest home outside of town, up on the mountains. So at some point after this is when they moved. I, I tend to think probably pretty soon, probably when they got back from Samaria, she would have been on up in years by then, and he probably decided it's, it's probably time we move. And um, remember, they had to go somewhere when they fled from Jerusalem. So for a time, uh, they may have been in Antioch, but um, up in the area around Ephesus was a much more hospitable climate for an older person, and it's just a prettier place than the desert. So anyway, that's going to be his exit. Peter will still be with us uh, for a little while. But the story, we'll go through the rest of the chapter next week with Philip uh, and the Ethiopian. And after that, in the next chapter, we switch the rest of the stories about Paul. And so all of the early players that we're seeing that are the main stars are going to be su supporting cast, beginning with the next chapter. Any questions or anything? Well, Lord, we thank you for the night. Thank you for your word. We pray, Lord, that it'll make sense. Help us to see truth. Help us, Lord, to uh, see uh, the, that you're in the process of changing and reforming our worldviews. And that it's okay because they need reforming. And we pray that we will uh, learn to be cooperative not only in that, but in practicing truth as the Holy Spirit brings us into situations where it's needed. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, blessings see you Sunday.